Mickey Mouth 43, let's start to look at chapter seven in the central limit theorem. Uh, we have a few learning outcomes. We wanna recognize central limit theorem problems, all right? Meaning we gotta look for certain vocab terms that'll help us say, oh, I'm using the central limit theorem. And when you hear a central limit theorem, we haven't talked about it just yet, we'll get to it. It's the main idea in chapter seven. I will sometimes abbreviate that with the acronym CLT, not to be confused with BLT. All right, we will classify continuous word problems by their distributions, and we will apply and interpret the central limit theorem for means. Now this comes out of your book directly, and while I love your book, um, for the most part, especially because it's free, one thing that I don't like about your book is that it totally ignores the other sampling distribution which is the sampling distribution for proportions. So what I'm referencing when I say all of those things is we're getting towards the end of that ginormous trait table that we had talked about. We are finally moving to these last two columns. So your book does a great job explaining this column, the sampling distribution for averages, and it does almost nothing in talking about the sampling distribution for proportions. So we will supplement what little your book does discuss with, um, with everything in our lecture packet here. And here's, here's the gist of it. If I really wanted to sum this up or oversimplify this um, from chapter six to chapter seven, we are gonna take a population distribution from chapter six and look at a sampling distribution for chapter seven. And there are rules from going from the population and looking at averages within your population. And that's what your book does in chapter 10. And again, it ignores this column. So we're gonna also flip back to categorical variables, categorical data in a bit. We spent the last few chapters, chapters four, five, six, and seven, all with numerical data. We're gonna finally go back to categorical data and look at some proportions, but that won't be till the end of this chapter. And again, I wanna reiterate, I love your book, it's free, but it doesn't go over this. So we are taking chapter six problems and bumping them up to something called sampling distributions. So we're gonna take this graph and we're gonna make new graphs, all right? And those new graphs are called sampling distributions. Because again, a distribution is a fancy word for graph. And I know I keep saying all this, but it, there's gonna be some confusion going from here to here. So I just wanna take a real wide zoom out. We're making new graphs, all right? And with those new graphs have some new rules and these are the rules for them. Okay, let's dive in, okay? So as I read this problem, like always, start with what is the variable for this problem, all right? So data suggested that the distribution of platelet size for patients with non-cardiac chest pain is approximately normal with a mean of 8.25 micrograms and a standard deviation of 0.75 micrograms. The figure below shows the corresponding normal curve. All right, so I'm gonna just scooch this up so we can see the graph. All right, and before we get to the next part, I just want us to look at some buzzwords that are playing themselves out so we get in the habit of looking for those. So the first thing I saw here was we had an approximately normal curve there was the mean, right, 8.25 micrograms, and there was the standard deviation. All right, and again, this was numerical data, but what was this data for? What was our variable? It was right here, this is platelet size, all right? So really, really tiny things, these platelets, because micrograms is point I think it's 10 to the negative sixth. I think it's actually, this number is 0. 0.000008 grams. So they're really, really teeny is what's happening here. So platelet size, really teeny. Um, but there's our, there's our variable. So our X variable here is platelet size. And the units are in micrograms. And they gave us enough information to say that the population was normally distributed with a mean of 8.25 and a standard deviation of 0.75, okay? And I wanna reiterate that right now, this is a chapter six setup, right? We're talking about all the patients. Here's the population distribution. There's the, the center, 8.25 is falling under that peak and you see them scaling their, their x-axis, right? One standard deviation above, two standard deviations above, three 
above and then one, two, and three below. So technically this would have an X along the X axis. If I was gonna label this property properly, excuse me, this would be platelet size. And the units would be micrograms. If there was gonna be a Y axis, which there isn't, but if there was going to be, oh, I don't think you can see my little label. Let me just scooch that up a bit, there we go. If you were gonna see my label on the Y axis, it would be probability. All right, but again, we don't have the calculus for that. No problem. All right, so again, I, I wanna reiterate, this is something we call the population distribution. All right, these are all the graphs that we made in chapter six. These were all of these non-cardiac chest patients. All right, and then we're gonna switch over to something called sampling distributions. So before we go to the next part, what I'm gonna be trying to explain in this next chunk of things is how we go from chapter six to chapter seven. How do we go from looking at all non-cardiac chest patients and graphing all of their platelet sizes to looking at random samples of five, 10, 20, 30 um, cardiac, non-cardiac chest patients and looking at their averages. So we're gonna go from looking at everybody and plotting one number for per, per person to taking random samples and graphing their averages. Okay, so here's what happened. I'm gonna scooch this up so we can get all of it in. Okay, so Minitab, that, that computer program that I'm not gonna have us buy because it's like $1,000 and it's not worth it. Um, we bought StatCrunch instead, or maybe we're using Excel instead, but Minitab was used to select 500 random samples from this normal distribution with each sample consisting of five observations. Okay, so let me stop at that sentence before I read the next one, and I want, I want to explain how this first sentence leads to this first graph. Okay, so from all of these patients, let's say I took a random sample of five of them, and I'm just going to fake these, these data points. So like I took somebody here, 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 and here. And then between those five data points, between those five platelet sizes, I got the average of these five numbers, and I plotted that point somewhere on this graph. And then I went, I erased those five marks. Okay, thanks for playing. And I got a different random sample of five. So maybe here, 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 and here. I'm just making these five little data points up. And of those five patients, I got their little average, right? I got their X bar. I added these five numbers up, divided by five, and I put an extra dot on this graph. All right, and I repeated that process 500 times. So I took another random sample of five, got an X bar, put it on the graph. Another random sample of five, got an X bar, put it on the graph. I repeated that 500 times and I made this new sampling distribution. All right, so we're up top, we called this a population distribution. This is now called a sampling distribution. All right, I know it's really tiny in here, but take a look. X bar is now along the X axis. So we're here, we had X, now we are plotting averages, right? It took a random sample of five, got that average, put it on the X axis, or technically now the X bar axis. All right, so I'm graphing averages. When it says sampling distribution, okay, distribution, fancy word for graph. I am graphing averages, graphing averages from my sample of size five. All right, now I can do that again and again and again, but I'm gonna increase the sample size. So now instead of taking five patients, now let's say I took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right now I have ten dots and I find the average, whatever that is between those ten values, add them up, divide by ten, plot that number onto this graph. Find another random sample of ten. Add their platelet sizes up, divide by ten, plot that number on this graph. And I keep repeating that. And I have got 500 little X bars here. I'm gonna erase this. All right, so I'm gonna take 500 X bars, 500 averages when I'm taking 10 patients at a time. All right, then I'm gonna take 500 averages when I'm going 20 patients at a time, 500 averages when I'm taking 30 patients at a time. All four of these things are sampling distributions. So you can make multiple sampling distributions from your one population distribution just depending on how much time, money, and effort you wanna put into this. Now with Minitab, it's not a whole lot of effort, it's awesome. All right, and when I say
say sampling distribution, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reiterate that X bars, even though they're really tiny here, the X axis is now a graph of averages, all right? So we're not looking at everybody all at once, we're looking at averages, all right? So from this population distribution, you can create a new graph. That's how we bump from chapter six to chapter seven. Take a chapter six graph, or we actually could technically take a uniform distribution and do this. You can take any graph and do this, but instead of taking or having your normal graph with X on your X axis, graph averages and put X bar on your X axis. All right, so with that, with these four sampling distributions, I want us to take a look at almost all of their socks. You can see that the O is crossed out. We don't have the original data, so I don't want us to focus too much on outliers, but let's look at shape, center, and spread. What can we see that they have in common? And what can we see is different about these three? So we wanna compare, right? We used to compare socks in chapter two. We're gonna head back to that. So let's take a look at this. If I, if I look at this, this sampling distribution, it's looking pretty good, right? This is looking roughly symmetric, right? I would dare say approximately normal. Right? So all of these, all of the shapes are roughly symmetric, or you could call them unimodal, right? But I'm actually going to go a step further and say they're all approximately normal. And if you're asking, well, how do I know if it's officially approximately norm? Uh, uh, ugh, that's not words. How do I know that it's officially approximately normal? We're going to talk about how you can de determine that in a little bit. We're not there yet, but trust me for right now, these are actually approximately normal. All right, for the centers, if I was going to try and figure out the centers, I'm going to look below that peak. So if I look below that peak, that's looking at around, what, 8.2, right? If I'm looking around this peak, it's around 8.2. This peak, again, pretty close to 8.2, 8.25. And this one's still pretty close to 8.2, 8.25. So the centers are all pretty close to 8.2, and the units on this would be micrograms. Every statistic has the same units as your variable because statistics are summarizing your data. All right, now let's look at the spread. All right, so the spread here, if I'm looking at this, it looks like it goes from about 7.35 to 9.30. All right, the spread here goes from 7.5 to maybe 8.85. Right here, 7.8 to 8.7. 7.8 maybe to 8.7, but it looks even a little bit um, smaller, right? So what I'm trying to assess here, what I'm trying to make us see is that as the sample size increased, right? As sample size increased, I think you'll give me that my spread decreased, right? This x-axis, at least the spread on it, got smaller and smaller and smaller. So I'm gonna say as sample size increased, or I'll say as n gets larger, right? I notice that spread decreased. And just as a note, if your spread is decreasing, that also means that all of your other measures of spread, the ones that we picked up in chapter two, they're also all decreasing. So range decreases, right? Um, the IQR would have decreased, all right, variance would have decreased, and the other one we had from chapter two was standard deviation. That would have also decreased. So one, one of the takeaways is I want you to see as sample size increased, right, as I went from averages of five or averages from five people to averages from 10 people, to averages from 20 to 30, that the standard deviation decreased. And we love to say this phrase in stats. So you'll hear me repeat this lots of times, all right? So I'll say stats folks love this. We love to say as sample size increases, variability decreases. probably experienced this phrase in your real life, you just haven't, um, you didn't have the vocab around it, right? If you're taking, let's say you're going to talk about an average test score, and I'm going to make these numbers up, okay? 
So let's say you were taking, let me get a spare piece of paper real quick and we will make these numbers up, okay? So if I had just, let's say two test scores to initially start this out. So somebody scored a 70 and somebody scored a 90, right? You would tell me that the average between those, you would say that was 70 plus 90 divided by two, all right? And if I crunch that number on my calculator, 70 plus 90 divided by two, you would tell me the average was 80. Okay, and I just want us to, oh, let me write two test scores, excuse me. But I just want you to take in mind, your sample size was only two people here. Right now, if, if I had such a small sample size, let's say a third person took a test, right? If a third person took a test, and now we bumped up to n equaling three, it was 70, 90, and then 10, right? So somebody bombed that, that test, right? Then the average, would be 70 plus 90 plus 10, and that would get divided by three. And like we talked about in chapter two, these outliers definitely affect your average, right? Let me divide this by three. So the average is now 56.7, right? So this changed my average severely, right? My average varied by a lot because I, I only had two test scores. So this, this third test score is gonna carry a lot of weight in the average. Okay, so now let me give you another example, okay? So let me scooch this up, and I wanna show you how when your sample size is larger, that 10 won't make that much of a difference. So let's say now I had 20 test scores. And just for the sake of um, going quickly through this, I want to say I had 70, 90, I had a bunch of 70s and 90s. All right, so let's say I had, I'll even phrase it as I had 10 of each, okay? So I had 10 scores of 70 and 10 scores of 90. I'm going to put the dot, dot, dot here. So I had 10 scores of 70 and 10 scores of 90. And let's see what the average would be here. So if I was going to do the average here, it would be, 10 times 70 plus 10 times 90 divided by my 20 students, right? So let's see what that average would have been. So I would have done 10 times 70 plus 10 times 90, and I would have divided by 20, and wouldn't you know, my average is still 80. Okay, now, and let me just remind myself, this numerator, let me, for, for where we're going with this, let me remind you, this was 1600 over 20, and that's how I got 80. All right, so now I want you to see that this average will not vary as much when I drop that 10 in. So now, let's say that 21st student, right, I'm gonna go up to 21, and we're gonna add a score of 10. So we had 70, 90, 70, 90, the same way we did, but we had that last student now get 10. Right, so really what I'm saying is I had 10 scores of 70, I had 10 scores of 90, and then I had that one score of 10. So now we have that, that student that's not doing so hot on this test, but I want you to see that this outlier does not affect your average as much. So my average in this case would be 10 times 70 plus 10 times 90 plus that extra score of 10, and I'm going to divide it by 21. So I'm gonna do, on my numerator, 10 times 70 plus 10 times 90 plus that extra 10. So my numerator is 1610. Let me divide it by 21. And you can see my average did not move nearly as much as when we only had the three students, right? So when we look here, right, my average changed by a ton, right? It went from 80 down to 57. Here it went down for from 80 to 77, so change not as severe, right? Nowhere near as severe. So when your sample size increases, your averages don't move as much. We would say your variability decreases. Literally, the average does not change. It does not vary as much. And that's what we're trying to lean into here. As sample size increases, 
those averages become harder and harder to move because outliers aren't as big of a deal. We have a lot of other data to counterbalance that. Okay. So two things I want to note. I, I did. I noticed the first one here. As sample size increases, variability decreases. We love that. I also want to point out because this will change when we get to example two. Let me get all of these in view. All right. The other thing I want to point out, and I'll write it down in just a moment. I want you to take note that your population distribution was approximately, ugh, I'm not using my words. Your population distribution was approximately normal and all of your sampling distributions were approximately normal, okay? So I wanna, I wanna make sure we, we write that out. So I want you to take note that for this first S, all of your sampling distributions were approximately normal regardless of sample size, okay? So I want you to see that your population distribution was approximately normal in shape and all sampling distributions were also approximately normal regardless of shape, excuse me, regardless of sample size. All right. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because it's going to change when we get to example two. So I want to point that out. If you start with a normal distribution, a normal population distribution, I don't care if you have averages from five folks, 10 folks, 20, 30, 1,000, two, one, it doesn't matter. Your sampling distribution is already approximately normal. All right, so we'll flip the page and see what happens when your population distribution isn't approximately normal. I'll see you in a bit, bye.